Trevor, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, Brett. And Trevor, thank you for making space in the colloquium for, for me to come and speak. I think I, I last did it, it was maybe six or, or seven years ago, and talking then about a, a slightly different condominium project, which I'll touch on and, and, and then leap off from into my current preoccupation with condominium, not in the city, but in the country. Um, but first, condominium in the city. So as many of you know, um, I grew up in a household uh, with a geographer. And uh, that geographer test drove his field trips uh, on his kids. And uh, so I was taken on many field trips over the years up the Fraser Canyon and elsewhere. And so when I started teaching property law at UBC, uh, one of the things that was sort of built into my DNA maybe or my my approach anyway was, was, well, how am I going to connect what we're talking about in the classroom with what's out there uh, in our immediate environment? How am I going to connect the doctrine of property uh, with the city? And maybe thinking a little more grandly, how can I help students read the city as a property text? Right? And so I didn't have a budget for field trips. I couldn't take them anywhere. There would be all sorts of interesting places I might take them. But um, I could fund them bus fare and we could get down to False Creek. And uh, so I thought, well, what am I going to say about property and False Creek? Well, you stand on the shore of False Creek and you see um, variations of views like these that are on the cover of John Puntner's The Vancouver Achievement and Lance Berlowitz's uh, uh, Dream City. Uh, condominium has become the uh, dominant architecture, at least on the downtown peninsula. And, and what one sees perhaps as a geographer or as an urban planner or as a designer is steel and glass and maybe Vancouverism and the podium and, and tower. Um, but what should I encourage the students to see as a property law teacher? Um, well, the legal architecture that is behind um, and shaping these structures in glass and steel and concrete. And that legal architecture is strata property. Um, or condominium. We call it strata property or strata title in British Columbia, but it's the same legal form. And what is that legal form? Well, it's a package of rights. Uh, the first is a right of an individual to your space, right? This room or your unit within the building is your private property. So that's the first thing, your right to private property. Then you, along with all of the other owners, share a right to the common property, the stairwells, the elevators, the exterior walls, the roof, if there's a weight room, a pool, the footing on which the building stands, that's the common property and you share an undivided interest in the common property. Uh, then you have a right by virtue of your ownership to participate in the collective governance of the private and the common property. You can't smoke in your unit, you can't hang your clothes on your balcony, uh, uh, the weight room closes at 10 o'clock. Um, you participate in the creating of those rules that govern the common and the private property. Uh, and then you have fourth an obligation to contribute to the maintenance of the common property through your monthly dues. So these are the four things that make up condominium. Your private interest, your share of the common property, your right to participate in the government of the private and the common property, and your obligation to contribute to the maintenance. That's the package that condominium allows. And what it does is facilitate this massive increase in the density of ownership. One can think of other ways of creating a legal architecture that would allow for people to occupy these spaces. Landlord-tenant law does that. These could be residential tenancy buildings where what you held is a lease from a landlord. But, but no, for the most part in British Columbia, at least in new build structures, well, the city is trying to encourage uh, rental structures, but the legal architecture is not of a residential tenancy, not of a co-op, but of a condominium. And how do you create this legal architecture? Well, you create it by submitting what's called a strata plan. And this is one page from a, from a strata plan, and actually the building is, is, uh, is this one right here. Uh, this one, the peninsula, right at the foot of Davie Street. And it creates or, or an owner developer creates the private property interests by submitting a strata plan. And you can see here, this is a cross section of the seventh floor and all of the areas within strata lot 23 are marked. The areas that aren't marked as within a particular strata lot are common property. And so here's the corridor and the elevator and the service shaft. Right? So it's the deposit of a strata plan 
that creates and facilitates the stacking. And so here's a, a, a vertical cross section or a horizontal cross section. I can never remember which is which. But anyway, right? You can see them stacked up. So where there was once a single private interest or a single fee simple interest, there can now be several hundred stacked in a vertical column. And something that I'm working on at the moment is, is the ways in which this spatial reorganization of ownership is having an effect on how we understand what it means to be an owner of an interest in land. Right? Each of these people who own strata lot 83 and 78 and 73 are owners of interests in land, but the spatial reconfiguration of ownership is forcing um, statutes, and, uh, legislatures and courts to change what it means um, to be an owner. So that's a, th that's a different talk. Trevor, you can have me back maybe in another five or six years. Um, I, my attempt to then understand condominium in the city or strata property in the city involved not only describing the legal forum and how it emerged and what it facilitated, but also it spread across the city. And so this is a map of all of the individual strata property or condominium buildings in Vancouver as of 2010. And there were slightly more than 4,000 of them creating over 100,000, 100,000 individual strata units. And that's in Vancouver proper. So a city of 600,000 has, has more now than 100,000 strata units. This is a major form. This is becoming the way that if people own interests in land, uh, will they own within strata property or condominium? And there's all sorts of interesting stories that one can tell about this and about how um, it m maps on perhaps the stories of gentrification as, as the first developments happen in Kitsilano and then spread to Fairview Slopes and then, and then to the eastern part of the city. Uh, so a lot of my attention has been on condominium in the city. But condominium or strata property also facilitates landscapes like this. So the same statute that allows for the subdivision of parcels within buildings allows for the subdivision of parcels on what the statute calls bare land or vacant land. So that each of these buildings here, each of these homes, sits on a strata lot. And the areas that are not marked as belonging to a particular strata lot, the roadways, are common property. So this is, this is uh, 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 aerial image from a few years ago, just as one's heading west, just before the Portman Bridge. Portman Bridge is about here, so this is the Trans-Canada, so we're in North Surrey. Uh, and another uh, bare land strata subdivision here. So having looked at and explored condominium in the city, I thought, okay, uh, uh, what is the scope and extent of condominium, well, if not in the country, in the suburbs, um, beyond, right? To what extent are people using this capacity to subdivide bare land uh, uh, to create particular landscapes, landscapes such as this? And the, um, the literature that, that sort of got me thinking about this is, is a literature from the 1990s in the US uh, uh, that, uh, that investigates the gated community. Uh, and says that, or at least argues that um, these housing associations, the legal model is a little bit different, but the result is approximately the same. These housing associations create a private topia or a fortress America. Um, they create the capacity to, uh, 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 to build exclusive communities of owners um, and to keep the rest of the public at bay. Uh, and you can do all sorts of things in developments like this, like require that a house be built with materials costing at least $700,000. And in effect, one creates a very exclusive socioeconomic community. And in the US, where socioeconomic uh, 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 levels map so closely on race, a lot of attention to the capacity of these privately governed communities um, to exclude, uh, to create private utopias, private utopias in Evan McKenzie's memorable phrase. So my project then was, well, let's see if I can figure out where bare land strata exists within British Columbia, how many there are, when they were built, and should we be concerned about this? Are there things happening in British Columbia that map onto what's been happening south of the border that we should be aware of? If not gated communities, then, then exclusive communities of owners governing themselves. And now here's my hard data. This is fun because we don't often create much hard data that's outside of, of 
of an analysis of cases. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, you would not believe the amount of work it took to, to get 2,406. Um, that is the number of bare land strata developments in British Columbia at the end of 2014. There's 2,406 of them. Uh, it required me hiring a couple of students to go through every single strata plan and there's tens of thousands of them identify which strata plans subdivide buildings and which subdivide bare land. Uh, it took a pile of work, most of a summer's worth of work, but 2,406 bare land strata subdivisions. And those 2,406 create 42,393, I just have to emphasize the data <laughs> for a law prof, uh, 42,393 uh, individual strata lots. All right, so, so, and, and that took an enormous amount of work, as I've said. I mean, so part of this project has been actually to describe a phenomenon, right, to make it visible. Uh, we didn't know how many there were or where they were or when they were built. Um, and I think that describing and making visible is then the first step towards, and ought we be concerned about this? Well, we can't really answer that second question until we know where uh, they are. So how did they come about? Uh, well, a few statutes for you, and there'll be mercifully few. Uh, British Columbia introduced the Strata Titles Act in 1966. This is the 50th anniversary of the Strata Titles Act, borrowed the template from New South Wales and plunked it down in British Columbia. It was the statute that then facilitated the subdivision of, of buildings into, into private parcels. And beginning in 1974, the government then began to extend the capacity to subdivide buildings uh, to bare land. So the first step in creating a condominium is that you deposit a strata plan. And that strata plan, as the section indicates, creates land that acts as any other land. You have a legal interest in your unit. That's an interest in land. Um, and it can be transferred, devolved, mortgaged, leased as any other parcel of, of land. Uh, now, the, then the next step uh, is a strata plan shall um, subject to sections, subsections three and four, define the boundaries. So we've seen that in the peninsula. You define the boundaries of each strata lot. Subsection uh, four, for the purposes of 1D, the boundaries of a strata lot shall be defined by reference to floors, walls, and ceilings. Okay, so the lot is defined in three dimensions by floors, walls, and ceilings. You need a building. But in 1974, um, the province added, where the owner developer intends to provide only support structures on a horizontal plane, uh, 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 um, by reference to the support structure. And so what this allowed was for an owner developer to put up a few two by fours on a piece of land or a concrete pad um, or a little bit of gravel that marked the space on the land that would become a separate strata lot. You no longer needed a building. And after 1974 you could, by erecting a support structure, and it could be as flimsy as a few two by fours, mark out the space that was an individual strata lot. And the support structure, and you can see the definition in the act, it, 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 um, it means really just about anything that you put on the land or even um, intends to provide. You could say, well, I intend to provide support structures. So it was this flimsy arrangement, uh, uh, but owner developers um, took advantage of it. And the very first strata, bare land strata, was built, uh, uh, more data, maps, and maps created, I should say, with the help of uh, many conversations with Sally Hermanson over the years about how to display uh, uh, data, and then with Eric Weinberger's terrific cartography, and you'll, you'll recognize Eric's imprint. Um, so that's the very first, a dot on a map. That's the very first. It's on Shuswap Lake uh, in 1975. And I apologize, I'm working with draft strata plans here, but, but this is the plan that is submitted to create that very first bare land strata. And you can see each of the lots, there's strata lot one right here, strata lot two, strata lot three. In between there's common property which provides access to Shuswap Lake. So this is along the shore of Shuswap Lake. So common property, so you could bring your boat along the road, this road that provides access to all of the strata lots and the lake, um, and then connecting with the main road. 
So what does the plan do? It creates these lots as private parcels and then designates, you can see here, common, the roadway as, as common property. And, and what does that look like today? Just note the, the sort of kinked road and the, and the axis here and the main road here. Well, here's a Google Earth view of that same property today. You can just make out, here's the main road, here's that kinked access road, and here's the common property access to, uh, to the water. So this was the very first one in, 19, in 1975. Uh, owner developers very quickly got interested in this form and the next year there were 19 more of them. And you can see them beginning to spread uh, from the Shuswap and down into the Okanagan and the lower mainland um, up Squamish and, and on to the island. And what did these strata plans create? Well, a common development was that lakeside development um, on Shuswap Lake. Uh, another common uh, development in these early plans was, was a, a strata lot or a strata parcel like this. Um, anybody uh, want to hazard a guess about what type of development this is creating? Was that a hand? No, no. Um, this is a trailer park. Oh yeah, okay, good, Philippe. Yeah, a trailer park or manufactured homes. Um, this is it today in, in Chilliwack. Um, and you can see uh, from the right longer and thinner strata, right, right enough for a, uh, a manufactured home. Uh, so another common use. Uh, uh, another use was this one on Lac La Hache, um, subdividing an island into 21 strata lots. Now this development caused some controversy because the regional plan required that subdivisions be no smaller than, um, than 10 acres. Right? And this was a 20 acre island that under the regional plan should only be subdivided into two units. Um, but the uh, um, developer under the bare lands support structure strata option subdivided it into 21 units, so much smaller than the uh, regional uh, bylaw allowed. And and in 1977, there was uh, an enormous, again, about another, I uh, can't remember the exact number, but 25 or 30 more developments, many of them taking advantage of this capacity that you could subdivide land more densely than you could under the regional uh, zoning. And so here you can see, again, cluster in the Shishwap, uh, um, and more on Vancouver Island and down uh, in the lower mainland. And so the government responded in 1977 uh, with a, with a stopgap measure that right, the Strata Titles Amendment Act, the registrar shall not accept for deposit a support structure plan uh, unless it has first been approved by an approving officer. So an approving officer had to, had to say, yes, this complies with our local uh, 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 zoning bylaws. And, and in the rush, the, the act was passed uh, in the beginning of August and assented to, so it came into force October 18th, but was backdated to, to June 24th. Right? The government was racing to try and stop these, these developments that, that were happening. And early the next year, 1978, uh, the first strata regulations were, were introduced. And again, you can see here the, the legislature saying you can't do this unless an approving officer approves and it complies with an official community plan and it conforms with the respective municipal or regional bylaws. Uh, so, so in 1978, the template is set and now we really still have this same template existing today where you can take the strata title or strata property form and use it to subdivide bare land. Now let me just let this run through and you can see year by year where the developments are. You can see the cluster still in, in the North Okanagan, Shishwap, but more down around Okanagan Lake, a collection in the Lower Mainland, and extensive development on Vancouver Island, scattering in the Kootenays and, and, uh, and in the North. So one of the things I'm still working with is, is how to represent this stuff. Um, it's hard to see exactly 
the density of strata plans in some parts of the province because it's just a black blob. Um, so trying to figure out the scale and how to represent this is, is still an, an ongoing challenge. But I can say a few things uh, about, the, about, the, about the location and places. So it looks like Vancouver Island, the lower mainland, and Okanagan are the densest. And in fact, that's the case. So here is the strata, bare land strata plans divided by uh, land title district. And I should just go back a slide and, and show you there's seven land title districts. So Kootenai, Okanagan, uh, New Westminster, Vancouver, which include uh, Vancouver Island. So I've, I've grouped the strata plans by region. And you can see that almost half of them, so just about 1,200 uh, or just about 1,100 of the, f of the, of the 2,200s that are on Vancouver Island. Uh, the next biggest region is the Okanagan and then New Westminster, which is basically the Fraser Valley. Uh, and here's a few more uh, uh, in close shots. So, oh, this wasn't supposed to scroll through. Beg your pardon. Uh, the story, I think, and this only came to me when I began mapping, is that this is in large part a Vancouver Island phenomenon. Uh, and southern Vancouver Island in particular. And so here's Victoria, right? Here's the, here's the ferry terminal, Ascendance Peninsula. Um, this density in Langford and in the suburbs of Victoria is this is where a large proportion of, of the strata plans are. And they were uh, built in increasing numbers up through the 1990s and then the developments plummet, come back in reach a peak in 2008 and then drop off uh, since, since then. So again, I haven't really looked closely on mapping this against the economic cycle, but, but it seems to approximate certainly the tail off after 2008 um, matches the economic cycle and same with the recession in the, in the early mid 1990s. Okay, why would you as a developer want to use the bare land strata form especially after the government closed that loophole that prevented the subdivision that exceeded the, the local area. Well, let's look at a couple of examples. Um, there was another controversial development in the 1990s on Salt Spring Island, a place called Musgrave Harbor. Some of you may have, may have been there. Musgrave Harbor was created with this strata plan, so subdivided this parcel into 23 lots. And you can see a cluster of lots here on this peninsula that sticks out that creates Mus Musgrave Harbor, a couple here. And then this one's hard to see because it's such a different scale, tr strata lot 23. So there's this enormous strata lot up here and then a collection of small strata lots around the coast. And here's zooming in again. So this is all part of strata lot 23 and then the strata lots. And you can see the common property. Uh, here's access, the common property to the water. Here's a footpath. Uh, and again, if we zoom in with Google Earth, we can see that on the, on the one. Here's that footpath, the common property footpath to the public, or not to the public, but to the beach that's shared by everybody within the development. Here's the access to, uh, to the marina. So what did this strata lot do that was different and interesting? Well, it wasn't different. It was what other developers were taking advantage of, which is what's called lot size averaging. So that if you have a regional zoning plan that requires a minimum of one acre lots. Right? And so if you subdivide a, a 20 acre parcel, you would end up with, with 20 lots, each of one acre. But what the regulations allow you to do is to cluster those 20 lots in one corner of the property and then count those uh, uh, and, and, and then divide the total acreage of the property by the number of lots. So you can use this averaging. You can have 20 lots, but they don't each have to be one acre. They can be clustered around uh, uh, an, a particularly attractive amenity like, like the ocean. And that was uh, uh, in this regulation that allowed it, right? So uh, you have to comply with the community plan. You have to conform with bylaws, notwithstanding this requirement that you comply with the bylaws. Um, a proving officer may approve a bare land strata plan containing a lot of less than the permitted size so long as the total area of land in the bare land strata plan divided by the number of strata lots intended to be created is not less than the equivalent minimum lot size permitted. So you can cluster lots using this lot averaging to create particular 
density. Now, the people on Salt Spring Island were concerned that what was happening on Musgrave Harbor was um, that this massive lot, which was really just a, a, a wood lot, was allowing for this clustering of buildings around the harbor itself that was contrary to the community plan. Um, and uh, 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 the approving officer had approved it contrary to the community plan. Uh, uh, this is more detail than I intended to get into, but the government uh, repealed this requirement that the development meet the uh, community plan and, and only that it meet the bylaws. And there weren't bylaws attached to Mus Musgrave Harbor, and so the development was allowed to proceed. Um, so that's one reason why you might want to use this. Right? You could use this lot averaging to create density of, of structure then create common property or, or a single large lot. All right, what else can I tell you? Um, the single largest bare land subdivision in British Columbia is on Vancouver Island, just south of Duncan on the east coast. This is where, uh, where it is. It is 641 lots created with a deposit of this strata plan. Uh, and you can see the density of, of lots there. And here, this is the ocean here. So it's a sloping down to the ocean, everybody uh, with a view. And here's an aerial view of this uh, 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 strata plan, creating 640 lots. And you can see, this is actually an extraordinary just juxtaposition of the, <laughs> right, of the carbon economy that allows for a development like this, sort of looming above the, above the development itself. This is a development that, that, that is around an 18-hole golf course. That golf course is the common property that is shared by all of the owners. Now, why would this development model be attractive to an owner-developer? Well, you can drape this whole development with a set of bylaws. Remember that part of the package of condominium was not only your private ownership, but also the capacity to regulate the use of the private and common property. And so I don't know for certain, but I suspect this is a community um, that may require owners and occupants to be older than 55, um, that wouldn't allow recreational vehicles in the driveway, that would require particular paint colors to be used on the walls and particular roofing materials to be used. Right? So not only can you use the lot averaging, but you can, using the bare land strata uh, development, uh, technique, drape a development with a set of rules that govern both the private and the common property. Um, and then to create then a particular type of community, uh, maybe uh, one that amenable to seniors, maybe particularly homogenous in, in, uh, in, in other ways. So this is the largest. Um, at the other end of the scale, and actually much the most common, so this is the mode, the most common uh, development subdivides a lot into two. Uh, and here's an example. This is in Summerland. You can see the road coming down and the cul-de-sac. And this, uh, uh, the cul-de-sac creates an awkward lot. Um, and by the deposit of a bare land strata plan, the developer was able to create a road that's common area that provides access for this building to the public road. So this is a strata lot that divides this um, development right here into two. There's one lot there's a second lot, and there's the common property that provides access to the highway. Um, so another way of using the strata property to subdivide land, and um, another reason why it might be desirable if you're a developer, that you can use um, a much uh, less onerous requirement for building roads. Private roads don't have to be as wide. They have to allow for emergency vehicles, but they don't have to be the standard 66 foot or whatever it is. You can build smaller roads. So less of the land can be, uh, is required for, for uh, road building. So another possible reason. Uh, all of my examples so far have been residential, and that's because the vast majority of these developments are residential. But this is the North Surrey Auto Mall, uh, and it has used the bare land strata provision to subdivide this lot, this this hexagonal shaped lot uh, into uh, eight. All right, so here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four, five, um, six, uh, seven, and eight. Um, so one of the rare examples of, of a strata lot subdividing, or bare land strata being used to subdivide commercial land. It's primarily a residential phenomenon. So I'll, 
I'll, I'll stop here and, and open the floor uh, for questions and comments. And I'm really interested in your comments because I think what I've, what I've got is the data that will allow me to describe something that hasn't been uh, described before. And I'm figuring out how many layers I can add on to my base layer, which is the data about bare land strata subdivisions, where and, and, and when they've happened. Um, this is the map of the province that, that you've seen already that shows the locations of, of, of bare land strata. And it's, again, particularly attractive because of its capacity to, well, to facilitate subdivision in a context where a community of private owners can govern themselves right, and, and avoid some of the requirements for, uh, for, for building of roads. Now, it's one thing to describe this phenomenon, it's another to then ask that second question, um, which, is, which is, is this something that we can be concerned about? Uh, sort of adverting back to that literature in the US about, well, Privatopia and Fortress America. Um, some of these developments are gated, uh, but not most of them. Uh, most of them are, are, are not gated. Some of them are exclusive uh, and include golf courses. Some of them subdivide trailer parks. Uh, and, and are far from exclusive. Uh, so the, the form is being used, and this is true within buildings as with bare land, to subdivide an enormous range of, of, of structures or land at different socioeconomic, uh, different socioeconomic levels. So anyway, I'll stop there and would love the comments of a room full of geographers about, about, well, about any egregious errors I'm making. Um, and, and after we've got past the errors, what I can do with this data. Thank you all.